Welcome to the London Luminaries Lecture Series. It's lovely to have you here and to be celebrating 12 wonderful historic organisations working together collaboratively to share our local history. My name is Rachel Morrison and I'm from Marble Hill and I'll be the host for this evening. It is a great delight that I get to introduce our chair for this evening. Sadly, poor Professor Judith Hawley is unwell today. So the wonderful Angela Kidner, who is trustee of Pope's Grotto Preservation Trust has stepped in. And so it is with great delight, I'd like to welcome Angela Kidner. Thank you very much, Rachel. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to those of you who are joining us live and to those of you who are watching us on our YouTube channel. It's an honour to stand in for Judith, and of course we all wish her a rapid recovery. Thanks are owed to you, Rachel, and Chris, Robert, Judith and Ricky, and all those behind the scenes who've made this series possible. And also to you, our audience, who have, through your donations, supported the work of our historic locations. We all have reason to be grateful to the Lottery Fund, but it is the ongoing support of you and our visitors that keeps us afloat. This lecture series builds on the success of a previous series, Twickenham Luminaries and Thames Luminaries, and recordings of those are all available on Marble Hill's YouTube channel. And those of you who haven't been at one of these lectures before, why the luminaries? Well, this area of the river, known as the Arcadian Thames, was a magnet for creative and influential people, especially in the 18th century, due to its proximity to London which was increasing in resources as the centre of an expanding empire. The river between the palaces of Hampton Court and Richmond attracted royalty, aristocrats, artists, writers and wealthy property owners. The legacy of these luminaries was a rich tapestry of connections of poets, painters, politicians and princes that made the area the place to be. We will be exploring these riches further in a talk about Twickenhamshire, as part of Richmond Literature Festival on the 11th of November, put it in your diaries. Please see our website, London Luminaries, for details about any of our talks. And so now I would like to introduce our speaker, who is Claire Goff. She is the director of Pittshanger Manor and Gallery. She joined Pittshanger in 2016 and oversaw the 12 million three year conservation project to restore this rare and extraordinary example of Sir John Soane's architecture to his original vision. The newly restored manor and gallery reopened to the public in March 2019. Sone Restored, an exhibition that reveals the fascinating story of the restoration, runs at Pitts Hanger until May 2022. You must see it. Welcome to Claire Goff. Thank you so much, Angela. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I am absolutely delighted to talk to you tonight about painters, princes and personalities. Sone, the entertainer at Pitts Hanger. So architect Sir John Zome was a man of boundless intellectual artistic curiosity. He was as eclectic in the mix of company he kept as he was in the range of art and antiquities that he collected to show here at Pitsanger. He used Pitsanger to entertain and impress the Beaumont of the time, whether from politics and public life through to arts and academia. So I'd like to start by taking you back to 1800, when Sohn embarks on designing and building his country villa at Pitsanger in the village, as it was then, of Ealing. So in 1800, Sohn is about 46, and he's just made his name as architect and surveyor to the Bank of England. And as a man who came from very humble beginnings, he finally feels he's made it, and he needs a country house to reflect his newfound status. But it's also really important for him that he can use this country house to show off to his friends and potential clients his architectural skills and what he can do for them. So he wants to create this house really as a sort of walk in portfolio where he can impress them with his own architectural skills and hopefully get them to commission him to do something for them. And this dictates why for his country house he buys somewhere in Ealing. There was no point in having some gorgeous house in deepest Dorset or farthest Yorkshire. He needs it to be close to London. And the village of Ealing is just an easy carriage drive from central London, just one hour from the townhouse he then owned in Hoburn in Lincoln's Inn Fields. In fact, that townhouse was the first of three that he would later buy there, what would eventually become known as the Soane Museum. But in those days, there was just a single house, number 12. So Soane had several objectives 
when he was building his house, apart from having its place to show off his architectural skills. And each of these objectives greatly impacted its designs. So in addition to being a showcase, it was also a place to show off his growing collection. He had a collection of what would in those days have been contemporary art of Hogarth's, Turner's, Canaletto's, but also of amazing antiquities, ancient Roman and Greek artifacts. And several of the rooms at Pitsanger were specifically designed around this collection, pieces that he hoped would not only impress his guests, but also inspire both his sons, but also his students of architecture. So he designs Pitsanger as his dream house, and he has this rather grand notion of it becoming the dynastic home for the Soane family for generations to come. But first and foremost, he designs it as a place of entertainment. And there's Soane, sorry, I should have shown you that before. That's Soane at around about the time that he, um, that he, he designs Pitsanger. And here he is with his guests arriving up at the manor at Pitsanger. But before we step inside Pitsanger, let's just briefly look at what happens to the house after Soan leaves it. Sadly, Soan had a really terrible relationship with his two sons. And when their relationship fell apart completely in 1809-1810, it urged Soan, as encouraged by his wife Eliza, to conclude that with great regret they would have to sell Pitsanger and move back to their London home in Lincoln Fields, taking all of their collection with them. So at that stage, the house passed through the hands of several different owners. And over time, really sadly, so many of the Sonian features were covered up, extensions built, key features demolished. And you can see it here after quite some extension and having lost its original sense of Sonian design. Rather shockingly, in the, in the 1830s, the entire interior was whitewashed. All of Sane's dramatic interior decorative screens that we'll take a look at in a minute were painted over, um, arguably a piece of vandalism. So the, by the beginning of the 21st century, it really was very hard to detect Sane's hand in the building. And that's perhaps one reason why Pitsanger has remained relatively under the radar for so long until the conservation project. So in 2016, we embarked on a major conservation and restoration project to take the building back to Sane's original designs and peel back the layers of extensions and overpainting to reveal this gem of a building that Soane had designed and that was lying there underneath. After that 12 million project and the conservation was finally completed and we opened to the public. So the photos I'm going to show you are photos that show it as I hope it would help you imagine how Soane would have entertained in them when he was living there. There's a whole other story about the conservation which I'm not gonna to cover tonight, very happy to answer questions on it afterwards. But of course, please do come and visit Pitsanger where you can see, and as Angela mentioned, you can see the display so restored. It gives you an insight to some of the challenges that we faced along the way. But let's look at Pitsanger as it was in Soane's time. Here's a rather wonderful watercolour that Soane commissioned of Pitsanger. And you can see where you would have approached as a guest coming for the first time to the grand entrance arch that you see in the bottom right of the watercolour and then would have driven up the drive rather dramatically getting glimpses of the park beyond through the colonnade and your carriage would have stopped right in front of the grand facade with its four columns. And let's take a particular look at the arch. Here it is in close up and you'll see right from the first impression that Soane's giving you, he wants to impress on his visitors his classical credentials. Now many of you may know that really influential for Soane was that as a young man he won a scholarship from the Royal Academy to go off on a grand tour to Europe and this grand tour had an enormous impact on him and influences all of his work thereafter and you'll see right throughout Pitsanger, loads of classical references, including this wreathed eagle, which is a, a theme that recurs in several places in the manor. But I also wanted you particularly to look at the columns of the entrance arch, and here is a bit of a close-up. And this column demonstrates one of the most trademark of Sonian designs, the canopy dome. So here you see it in, in what's known as the handkerchief dome. It looks as though the four corners of the dome have been held down like a handkerchief. And it might remind you of the design of some other very famous iconic piece of design that you can see across 
in every high street across the land. And of course, I'm talking about the telephone box. So when Gilbert Scott designs the telephone box many years later in the 1920s, he takes inspiration from, from Soane's wonderful um, pillars and, and canopy dome ceilings that he uses so often. But let's move on from the, the entrance arch and, and see how Pitsanger would have looked as he arrived for the first time at his front door, the green front door. And this impressive facade inspired by the Arch of Constantine in Rome, so another classical reference. And as we go in through that front door, this is the first room that you come to, the Tribune. And this is one of the other rather interesting observations about Pitsanger that people usually make when they come here for the first time. They're slightly surprised at how small the house is. Given that Soane was building his country house, why didn't he build something bigger? And actually, he makes something really rather domestic. And it's quite interesting, I think, to reflect on the fact that in his house in London, in central London, in Lincoln's Inn Fields, he was constrained by the fact that it was a house within a square and so had two houses either side of him. So completely constrained about the space he had. But here at Pitsanger, he had no such constraints. He had 28 acres, but actually built something quite domestic in size. And each of the rooms feels quite relatively small. And I think that's one of the things that people love about it when they come here. They feel they could almost move in straight away. But although it's small, Soane plays so beautifully with all the tricks of the trade to make the space feel bigger and the entrance grander than it would do otherwise. So here in the Tribune, where you're see seeing in this photo, you will have just come up the stairs and your eyes have been drawn up to the double height ceiling of the Tribune. You can just see the windows, um, the internal windows around the top. And then the other thing that he plays with is vistas. And it's difficult to see it in this photo, but you'll maybe see it in one of the next photos, is if that door ahead of us was open, you would look straight through the next room, a small drawing room, through his wonderful conservatory, out to the parkland beyond. And that vista to the parkland beyond, again, makes it feel much bigger than it actually is. There are two special features about this room that I'd like to draw to your attention. And one is if you look up at those Tribune windows at the top of the picture, you see that they are tinted amber. And this is to soften the light of England, the harsh light of Ealing, and soften it and make it a bit more like the soft light he was used to on his grand tour in Italy. But also I want you to look at the medallion on the right, the bronzed medallion. There's another one that reflects it on the other side that you can't see in this picture. And this medallion is exact copy of something that he installed at the Bank of England. It's relief of God's soul and Luna, something that was inspired again by the Arch of Constantine. And not only is he making classical illusions here, but he's also referring to the fact that he's got these in the Bank of England. And he's very much hoping that some of his guests will pick up on the fact that they could see these at the Bank of England and be impressed by the fact that he is the guy who designed the Bank of England. So on leaving the Tribune, we're going to walk right into the first suite of rooms that his guests would have come to. And this room here is the breakfast room. And you can see, again, we've got the canopy dome ceiling. So just like the dome that we saw on the entrance arch, but this time you're standing underneath the dome, this wonderful trademark of design of stones. This room is one of the most classical of the rooms in Pitsanger. It was designed specifically around a piece in Soane's collection that he bought in 1800, just before he buys Pitsanger. And you can see it on the side of the picture on the left. You can see it's the Cordor vase. It's a wonderful fourth century BC Greek vase. And this room, he, the color scheme and everything he does within it is designed to show off the vase to the best effect. So here is a picture of a photo of the vase as it is today. And you can see it's black vase, but with terracotta figures on um, painted on it. And this is the breakfast room as it is today. And you can see the black marble that he puts into those panels is designed to show off the Cordor vase to optimum effect. Now we walk through those double doors and here is when you get one of those vistas. You can see through the next room, the library, through the, the conservatory, through to the park. So you get one of those vistas. But can you also see the wonderful ceiling in the room next door? So here is one of Soane's other trademark ceilings, also a canopy dome ceiling, but this time the starfish design. This is the library. And again, this is a design that Soane repeats in almost every building that he does thereafter, perhaps most famously known in a design many years later in the 1820s, 
that he does at 10 Downing Street for the dining room at 10 Downing Street in rather more ornate fashion. So he's very much with these two rooms showing to his clients, look, you know, I could do a ceiling like that or I could do a ceiling like that and encouraging them to, to choose one of them for their next big building project. And then from the library, there, there's a picture of it as, as it is today, um, with a lovely decoration on the ceiling of the foliage coming in. But from the library, we go into this utterly, utterly different room, much more pared back, much simpler, simpler ceiling. But oh, what a dramatic colour. This is the small drawing room. And Soane specifically chooses the colour of this drawing room in order to make his collection of paintings, show them off to their very, very best. So this is the room where he hangs his greatest paintings. He has a canaletto either side of the mantelpiece and he acquires in 1802, so just while he is building Pitsanger, he acquires the set of eight paintings that make up a rake's progress by Hogarth and hangs them in here. And as I say, the red is designed to show off these, um, these oil paintings to best effect. And here you can see, we actually borrowed a rake's progress back from the Soane Museum for an exhibition. Um, sadly, it was delayed over lockdown, but we were finally, finally able to open it when, when lockdown lifted. And here you can see the paintings as we had them in our exhibition hung on this red wall. So you can just see how wonderful the red is. But let's find out a bit more now about some of the guests that Soane would have had to dinner. He used to have what he used to call intellectual banquets. Guests would have been expected to entertain the table with sparkling conversation, no pressure then. And here is a selection of three of some of his most regular guests at dinner. A prince, a painter, and a personality. I'm quite sure you'll recognize at least one of them, maybe all three. So on the left, we've got, of course, Turner. Turner was a great mate of, of Soane's. They had a real connection, perhaps having come from similar backgrounds, although very different in age, but they got on incredibly well. And they used to go fishing very regularly in the lake, the fishing lake here at Pitsanger. And of course, many of you may know, and many of you will, will be very familiar with Turner's house at Sandicum Lodge. And when Turner builds that a few years later, he takes great inspiration from lots of Soane's architectural ideas. Turner, interestingly, was the only guest who was ever allowed to stay the night at Pitsanger. So he was not really the sort of man that you'd want to, to meet over breakfast the morning after a heavy night the night before, but Turner was allowed to stay. Otherwise, it was just family who would have stayed. On the right, we have the future King of France, Louis the Philippe of France, who came to live in Ealing and actually taught at the nearby um, Great Ealing School for many years while he was in exile prior to returning to France for his short reign. But in the middle, Sir Francis Bourgeois, now you may know the name of Francis Bourgeois, who together with Desmond was the founder of the collection that makes Dulwich Picture Gallery. And this is a beautiful example of how whining and dining his friends ultimately proved really successful in generating new commissions for Soan, because of course Soane was commissioned by Bourgeois to build Dulwich Picture Gallery and it's such an exciting building as the first purpose-built picture gallery and becomes thereafter a model for almost all galleries that have been built thereafter with its fabulous use of roof lights um, to light picture galleries. So where would these three guests have dined when they came to dinner at Pitsanger? Well this is a contemporaneous watercolour of the eating room as Soane used to call it, the dining room at Pitsanger. We have extensive records of the dinners that Sohn used to have, not just of the guests, but of the food that was served and even of the conversation that would take place. Dinners for up to 20 in this rather grand room overlooked, as you can see, these four statues, um, two of whom are the goddess Ceres, the goddess of the harvest, rather an appropriate um, statue to have in the room. And here you can see the gloriously restored ceiling of eating room as it is today, and then laid up for a contemporary dinner. And then after dinner, they would withdraw to the upper drawing room and it's fabulous Chinese wallpaper here again represented in a, in a rather fabulous contemporaneous watercolour and here as restored and no photo ever does this room justice so please come and see this room um, in, its, in its true glory. But entertainment of Pitsang was not constrained to the inside. Soan really wanted his guests to enjoy walking around um, in his grounds outside. And here is a rather wonderful print from the British Library of the grounds at Bitsanger, now Walkle Park, um, but then his parkland. And he was famous for his déjeuner à la fourchette for 200 large garden parties outside in the main lawn, you can just see between the house and the serpentine lake there. 
But Soane fairly quickly realised the climate in Ealing did not encourage his friends to go off and discover the gardens as he wanted them to. So he made an adaptation to the house. So here's a watercolour of the back of the house. And you can see off the back of the main bit of the house, you can see the rather grand and wonderful conservatory that he felt he had to build so that his friends could enjoy the views of the park, even in inclement weather. So here's a view of the inside of the conservatory with its fabulous puddle of reflected um, of shadow of light from the stained glass that he inserts between the sash windows in the conservatory and here a rather lovely picture of the conservatory being used as Sona always intended for entertainment but in addition there was something else that Sona always wanted his guests to discover when they went off to go round the grounds and in this watercolour front of Pitsanger you can see if you look at Pitsanger the main manor, then the colonnade that joins it to his kitchen block, the low kitchen block on the right. Just to the right of it is a set of Roman ruins. Now, Soan felt very strongly after having gone on his grand tour that every grand country house needed to have a set of Roman ruins. Sadly, there were none at Ealing, but that didn't deter him. So he built his own faux Roman ruins and expected his visitors to come across it and have a look at it. So much so that actually he would encourage visitors to, after dinner, if they didn't go outside, to go up to that middle window. Can you see that set of three windows across the top? He'd take them up to that middle window to admire the ruins from there. But here is a picture of one of his guests' um, investigation of the Roman ruins. But sadly, the Roman ruins do sort of bring us full circle because the ruins perhaps best tell the story of the breakdown of Soane's relationship with his sons. One of the things Soane asked his son to do was to catalogue these Roman ruins. And to be honest, who wouldn't rebel if you were asked by your father to catalogue a set of ruins that you knew to be faux and to have been built by him? So when, as I said, the relationship with his sons broke down, Soan sold Pitsanger and with great regret returned to his London house in Lincoln Fields. And Soan's departure started Pitsanger's long journey through its many owners till it finally came to us, Pitsanger Manor and Gallery and Trust. But following Pitsanger's restoration, we have tried to continue Soane's legacy of using it not only to entertain our guests, but also through the art and the events that we display and host here at Pitsanger to inspire future generations in Soane's passions, art, architecture and design. We really hope that you will feel inspired to come and visit Pitsanger. And if you'd like to get involved, we would be absolutely delighted if you wanted to join us as a volunteer. We are so reliant on the support of volunteers to keep Pitsanger open to the public. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Claire. That was stunning. And just whilst we're here, you have in front of you on the screen the next of our talks. Tomorrow will be Pope's Grotto, Poetry Painting and Alexander Pope. And in January, we're starting our new series of a further six talks on January the 19th through to the 3rd of February. Thank you.